folks. Thanks so much for joining us today. I'm super excited because we have two guests with us today, and we're going to be talking about the topic of finding love. We have Dr. Gloria Horsley, she's 84, and Dr. Frank Powers, he's 82. And they both co-authored a new book called Open to Love, The Secrets of Senior Dating. Now, this isn't only for those folks in their senior years. I found this book to be jam-packed with amazing information, tips and tricks on what to do if you're new to dating, whether you're suffering from a loss, divorce, or death, um, what to do to get back in the game and to find your other half, your soulmate, whatever it is that you're looking for. Now, this book will help you find love in your golden years, yes, but like I just said, for everyone who is looking to find new love. Getting back in the game is hard, but finding love in your golden years doesn't have to be complicated. In Open to Love, these two therapists, both of them are, share their personal and professional story of love and romance in their later years. Inspirational and relatable, Gloria Horsley and Frank Power show readers how to face their fears about dating, identify with what they want in a partner, and learn how to find love in their golden years. Open to Love covers the ins and outs of online dating as seniors and how to turn every experience, even a horrifically bad date, into a growth experience from emotionally preparing to get back in the game and what to do when you've found someone Open to Love is the first and only stop on the road to senior dating. So like I said, it's not just for seniors. I think that many different people would be able to benefit if you're looking to experiment with online dating. Maybe you haven't before, but you want to, or maybe you haven't. It's just not working for you the way that you anticipated. I think these tips and tricks will definitely help. So thank you again for joining us. And now we welcome the two doctors. Hello, everyone. We're so excited today because we're talking about a topic that's very near and dear to all of our hearts. And we have with us today, Dr. Gloria Horsley and Dr. Frank Powers. And we're going to be talking about the secrets of senior dating. And I have to say, it's not only for seniors. Mm -hmm. I found this book to really be great for across the board for anybody that's looking for love. So that's just my take on it. But we're going to be talking about all the, the points of the book and get the expertise of these two doctors. So doctors, can you please give us an intro as to who you both are, a little bit about your professional careers and why we're here today? Okay, well, uh, I'll start out. Okay. I, <laughs> I could have you start out. Okay. I'm uh, Dr. Gloria Horsley. Um, early on, I was a clinical nurse specialist in psychiatry years ago, and my son was killed in an automobile accident. He was a 17. So I think I need to kind of add that because I moved through the death of my husband in a different way than some people might because I'd had a traumatic loss early on. Um, before my husband passed away, I was married for 60 years. I can't believe that old but anyway I was married I was married for 60 years and my husband passed away of a staph infection after his like 12th back surgery so he'd had a lot of back surgeries and I went into uh, I took my own advice because I've been a therapist for 40 years and um, I'm a psychologist also a clinical nurse specialist and a psychologist so um, I decided that I would take my own advice and what would my advice be to yourself, Gloria? It would be find a support group and get yourself uh, some support and help. So I called an agency that I knew in Palo Alto, California, and I said, uh, it's called CARA, and I, because I'm from Palo Alto, and um, I said, I don't think you're going to be able to find anybody for me because I've been in the field of grief, loss, and recovery for over 40 years. And he said, well, and I've had a child die and a spouse die. Lo and behold, he set me up with a guy who supervises a therapist at his program who had had a wife die and a, a child die. So I really got some expert advice. I went into a grief group 
And there I met a guy who played golf and I'm an avid golfer. So she golfed through grief. So I golfed through that first year of grief with this guy and we ended up uh, being connected and he, we actually lived together for a while and he decided I was too much for him. And he, he ghosted her. He ghosted me and oh, left the room. No. Yes. Yeah. Left the keys on the counter and said, I can't handle you. <laughs> right. I, I'm done. I can't handle it. Well, I was awesome. in Hawaii and with my family and with him uh, yeah. on Christmas vacation. That's when he ghosted me. He left. So I had heard him say, I was pretty mad and burned and you can imagine and hurt and whatever. Uh, and so I decided that I would um, go online and write a book and write a book and write about being a widow because I learned so much that year about some of the issues related to a loss of a spouse. Mm -hmm. And but I counsel a lot of people and I found out a lot of the advice I was given giving people for 40 years was questionable. <laughs> I broke a lot of the rules, <laughs> which I told yes. people. <laughs> so anyway, the guy told me uh, that he had gone online and met other women online and he would find somebody else, basically. And I'm like, OK, go for it. But um, so I decided to write a chapter on online dating. I went on Silver Singles and Frank was the second person I met on Silver Singles and I had a, a meetup with another guy and I had counseled people in therapy and heard them talk about their dating and meetups. And now here I am doing it. Second date, I met Frank and we've been together for- Ever since, ever three years. Since, going on three years. And uh, he's a love, the second love of my life. I've been very lucky to have two wonderful men in my life. So, you know, uh, the books is for you, for everybody out there to believe that there can be love again after loss. And uh, yeah. so you, you come to it differently than I do. Yes, I, I had several divorces uh, and one of the uh, ladies yeah. I was fortunate enough to be married to was another psychologist and we had a private practice together for about 17 years. And uh, we had a wonderful time. It was a great run. And it was really sad when, when it ended in divorce, but um, I decided that I would go online and this was 2000 and uh, I met a number of absolutely wonderful ladies, but the one that I really love, I met uh, just about the time I was saying, well, I'm going to have to retire. I mean, I've been at this for 40 years. I, I think it's maybe time I, you know, I'm in my seventies now and I'm, uh, you know, late seventies. Gosh, very late. <laughs> Back seventy nine. <laughs> so it was it was absolutely fortuitous because I was thinking about going into a senior community, and I thought, well, I'm I'm tired of fixing up my house. I'm tired of doing maintenance, and I'm not the same guy I was. I'm still okay, but not the same guy. So I don't want to do all this work and. I thought, well, senior community, mm -hmm. I probably the numbers of women <laughs> uh, are, are certainly in my favor. So <laughs> I'll try that out. But uh, I decided one more time to go online because I'd had a good experience with that. And Gloria shows up and oh, my God, what uh, what a change it means to have somebody who you love and care about and have fun with. And that's what we're all about is having fun and enjoying things and doing things together and just appreciating this part of our life, which is so different from when we were 30. Absolutely. We we kind of kid that we never would have gotten together in the first place. Oh, God, no. At 30, we were totally different. <laughs> we had totally kids. had oh, different. Oh, yeah. Uh, goals and aspirations. Oh, yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> really different. Really. Yeah. Different. But now we're like. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think that's. Part of the information that we try to give out to people is that, you know, what you wanted and what you did in your 30s may be quite different as it was for us, uh, you know, in our late 70s and early 80s. Uh, now, we're so compatible. We have so much fun together. And I never thought that was possible. I never thought that my 70s and 80s uh, could be like it is now. And guess what, ladies? He's four years younger than I am. 
Yes. <laughs> I, li I like older women, my cougar. <laughs> I love your story. It's absolutely beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. So let's talk about your book, uh, Open to Love. If you can love. Show everybody. Yeah, beautiful cover. Absolutely. And everyone has told us exactly what you said that. It is, you know, it could be for anyone, but we have a chapter called Through the Bedroom Door that I hope all seniors will read and look at because that's a little it, bit it, more. It, it is, I think, information that certainly I didn't have when I was younger, and I don't think that most of us grew up with the information about what aging does to the body, uh, what you need to do, and how intimacy can be just as fun and just as wonderful. At but any it is, age. It is different. Yes, yeah. different. Absolutely, absolutely. So, what prompted you to to write this book? Um, when well, when did you start writing it? Like, at what point? When I was in Hawaii with COVID, I you know I've written other books. I wrote uh, something called the In Law Survival Manual. I've written this is my I think tenth book. So um, I've written other books, but um, I really wanted to tell people, women particularly, about how it is to be a widow. I mean, I had told people things like, don't do anything for the first year. Well, I did a lot the first year. I sold my house. Um, you know, I had a, a, a country house. That, and you golf through Greece. And I golf. Yes. And I, you know, one of the things that I've found that I didn't know, which widows have told me, is never say no to any invitations. One of my friends told me that early on. And that really, and I would have said to women, well, do what you want to do. You know, if you feel like going out, go out. And now I would say, say, well, get out there. yes, get out there. let people take care of you. It's a gift. Yes. I, I fully agree with that. If, if you do find a relationship, uh, statistically, you live seven years longer if you in a relationship than if you're single. Wow. And it really makes a difference to have someone around. Just Especially for a guy. Connection, uh, just the fun and laughter. All of those things really help longevity. And when people talk about loneliness being the number one mental health issue for people in, in their later life, I think it's really true. And if you are not lonely, if you're excited about life and you're looking forward to it, it just stands the reason that you're going to live longer because you have something you live for. Yes. And if you're alone, it's really different. And, and also, I, you know, physical is so important now, particularly in this digital age. I mean, having somebody touch. just yeah. touch your yeah. hand, hold you, yeah. somebody who cares about you, yeah. you know, that you can climb in bed with at night. The dog's great, right. but you know they can't tell you when your lipstick's on your teeth. <laughs> and I, I'll tell you, uh, sex in my thirties was absolutely wonderful. I have nothing bad to say about it. But I'll tell you, snuggling in your eighties is absolutely just yeah. impossible. <laughs> I agree. I agree. It takes on a different form. Oh, it, means, it means so much. Yeah, it, so it does. Much. It does. So, yeah, I mean, like I said before, we we started recording, I, I read your book and absolutely loved it. Um, I think it holds true for really folks at any age, especially mm -hmm. now with social media. It's so difficult for young folks to even find someone. And online dating is, is very challenging. It comes with its challenges. So your book is really a nice guideline, too, as to what to do and what to expect. Right. You know, it, the, our very first chapter is you don't even have to be online to benefit from the first chapter, which is what has worked for you in past relationships and what hasn't. Has it worked? Stop. We see so many in our practices. We saw so many people repeating the same, same patterns pattern. with the same, the same people. kind of people. Yeah. Yes. You know, and you need in your 30s, you know, if you meet someone and they're quite different and, and difference really. Uh, stimulates and you feel like oh wow this is really great and you spend the next 20 years trying to change mm -hmm. them and to be more like you now when you're older we're really suggesting find someone that's more similar to you don't have to work so hard 
find some things that you both really enjoy and that you're both similar at and it's going to be much easier uh at this point and and stop trying to you know with these younger kids i see it with my grandkids they're looking at numbers how many people got in touch with me that were good looking what who cares you only want one person and you want tell them what you want Exactly. I want somebody who's financially responsible. I want somebody who's got a job. I want somebody who's got a retirement. I've got it. Have you? Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. I want somebody who play golf. To play golf with. Yeah. That's so important. Pickleball. Important for me. Yeah. Frank likes pickleball. And, you know, so you've got to tell people. But first, you have to know what you want. You have to look at yourself deeply. What is it really that I want? And what meets your needs now as as being different uh, somewhat than when you were younger? And some of the needs will be the same, but if you take a look at all the things that worked for you in past relationships and all the things that didn't work for you, it's a really good guidepost as to what to look for now and what to put in your profile if you're going to go online. You know, the other thing we talk about in the book, I I have so many widowed friends that say they don't want to be a nurse or a purse. Right. They think that's kind of funny and everybody laughs. And I say they're male nurses as well as female nurses. Right. And as far as being a purse goes, I want somebody who's financially responsible, who has a retirement. Yeah. You're never going to have exactly the same amount of money. You're never going to have exactly these kinds of things. But you got to talk about your health issues and things yeah. like that. Who will you have take care of you? If Like I had gallbladder surgery um, and my daughter came and took care of me. You know, look at your family. Don't expect this new partner to take on all of these roles. You know, she did have shoulder surgery yes, two days did. after I met her. <laughs> and I, I had to put, help her put on her clothes and comb her beautiful hair and uh, it was really wonderful for me i i i know you like sure. being I, a character. I, I, I didn't realize i liked doing that <laughs> you know it's funny my after my husband passed away my grief counselor told me because i was struggling having people do things for me and he said let other people do things for you they they enjoy it it's right. their way of of expressing love as well so i totally agree with that and tell people what you need be right. specific. I need some babysitting. I need somebody to take my daughter to the mall to shop for a birthday present. Ask people, I need my lawn mode. I mean, some people will show up and do it, but, you know, meet, meet your needs. Know yep. what they are. And also ask the other person what their needs are as well. Because right. it's, it's a two-way street. So, as you know, it's like give and uh, take. Not everybody's going to be good at what you ask. Some people will show up to take you to a movie and that's all they're going to do. Oh, geez. Yeah. They may take you to play golf or tennis and that may be it. Just take what people have got. You know, there are some people will be playmates. Some people will be soulmates. You know, <laughs> not everybody right. uh, is going to show up to meet the same needs. So let's talk about expectations. Like, I don't think it's realistic to expect to find the perfect person in your seniors. I think you're going to have to do a little bit of bending, right? In terms of, you know, have definite guidelines as to what you're looking for, but bend a little as well, because you're not going to find someone that meets all of your expectations, right? Well, it depends on how realistic you are. Yes. You know, you've got to look at what what's your bottom line? What are you willing to, what is it you need? Are you willing to put up with? Uh, dishes not put in the dishwasher or the you know whatever toilet seat up or down yeah Yeah. all all those major things you know it just depends on what you're you know you know yourself and and you know really look at what what is important but one of the things that we say is meet people as soon as possible in person you know the uh people who do matchmaking the matchmakers by the way are some people love them. It's very expensive. And what we yeah. found is this. The matchmakers get their people the same place you do. Online. Oh, is that right? Oh, yes. Yeah. Where yes. do you think else they're going to get them? <laughs> they go online. Particularly, they're looking for men because a lot of the matchmaking is with women. Now, I'm not knocking the matchmakers because they do a lot of your homework for you. What I want to say is if you're willing to create the time and space to do your own homework, 
you can do it and save your five thousand dollars or whatever. I think that's quite one costly. Of the things we mentioned in the book that it, that's really probably one of the pivotal things is don't try to do this online thing alone. Oh uh, yeah. Yeah, you need to get a dating buddy or dating buddies to be there for you and help you through the process. It needs to be a fun process. If it's not fun and you can't enjoy it and you don't have someone to sit around and laugh at these profiles and and about your experiences when your first meetups or whatever, uh, it can be a daunting process. And a lot of people will start it, they'll have a bad experience and they meet someone and they, or they'll the talk to who they said they Or they were. talk to one of their kids oh, and the right. kids say, oh, mom, you probably don't want to do that. That's but if you scary. get a dating buddy or dating buddies, yeah. they'll help you through those rough periods of just getting into the whole process and learning how to do this. Because it's a whole process. I mean, our parents didn't go through that process. They make people at dance parties or, or you know, at the bar or other places. And, and now they online, especially for women, because it's 50-50. Yeah, get that. It's 50-50. Yeah. women. So it's the best place in town. And it's one of the only places in town as you get older, especially, and the number of people you don't meet at work and you don't meet other people in right. different situations online gives you a real opportunity but but it's a learning experience you've got to learn how to do it and it's best done not alone you don't go in your head alone be there with other people have fun with the process enjoy it see it as being hey this is just a necessary evil some people say <laughs> you know it, it's the way to meet people however there are a lot of experiences uh that both Gloria and I've had I've certainly had more because I've been online more than Gloria was but there are people who don't represent themselves uh their the profile and who you meet are totally different there are people who are scammers and you do need to check people out and we talk But they're scam we want to say that. though they're there's scammers, scammers everywhere, everywhere. People, I get them on the phone People try to sell you tires for your car a new roof for your house come on That's right. you know be a good consumer Yeah and you just learn how to deal with them and you learn how to protect yourself. But all of that is much better done with with friends. And it's interesting, your children are not necessarily your best dating buddies. Mm -hmm. uh, your grandchildren, yes, because they have the expertise and they know this system and they know how to or do it. Or nephews and nieces and that are younger or been online. But friends who have gone through the process before are just like gold in right. this process. I, I was going to say, we talk about meeting up in person. What I wanted to say about it was when you do, um, when you hire a dating service, they don't let you see the pictures. And the reason they don't, they will set you up, but they will not let you see the pictures because they know how important it is, the physical attraction to meet someone right away and to see if there's any energy. I mean, we know there's a certain instinct we know, and it might surprise you who you'll be attracted to, who you won't be, you know. So you got to look beyond six feet tall. <laughs> I mean, I get so tired of hearing women say he's got to be six feet tall. Uh, you know, another thing you we're suggesting for people that uh, are a little bit older is stay within a five-year range. Yes. <laughs> Don't don't go. You over. know, guys, give up this idea that you need to have this young thing on your arm so that you can feel good and also impress your friends. Yeah. The, the fact is, if you want a partner, you want someone in your same cohort who's had the same kind of experiences and and you, you have that similar similar. You know, the same music. You know, yeah. you don't. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, more than five years, we find really, in a sense, does not necessarily work that. Way. Yeah. You know, that's so true because um, I was 19 when I met my husband and he was 10 years older than me at the time. And that didn't matter for decades. And then as we aged, it and he matter. always warned me of that, it became really um, visible, like, and affected us as he got into his 60s and 70s. And, right. Yeah. It does make a difference. Yeah. It yeah. Does. So let's talk about scammers because from what I hear... A lot of women my age, and I, I guess men too, I, I know of men that got scammed on online dating. And um, it, it's, it's there. It's there. Absolutely. But there, there are things like E-Verify 
and white pages and other things that check public records. You also want the person to say, look, I just want to make you sure you are who you are, and I want you to make sure I am who I say I am. So don't feel bad about checking out one another. This is just a natural thing that needs to be done so that you know that you're talking to the person as they present themselves. And never, never, never give money. Never. never. never the never. day you get money, yeah. very, I mean, it, I, it's incredible. I had a patient of mine uh, that he he really didn't think he, there was anyone out there for him. And I finally, after building his confidence, was able to help him get online. And he met someone very early, but they were not in his lo same location. It was a different location. And he said, uh, you know, I, I, I think I'm really getting connected with this person. I said, well, you know what? I think it would be really good at this point for you to check them out on the verify and my pages and make sure that the person is who they said they are. Well, he did. He followed my advice and he found out that the person that they were presenting themselves to be did not exist. Oh, yeah. no. And, and I had a client who was you know, she fell in love with this guy online. And I yeah. think you have to be careful about yeah. some people like to talk on the phone. They give their, they, and, and they, you can get so connected to someone that you overlook she didn't look all at, the evidence yeah. that says that this person she didn't may listen not be to her family. Oh, yeah. She didn't That's listen right. to anybody. No. Turns out the guy, she got the FBI. They, they, by the way, the she government, gave them a they're not going to help you. Oh, no. no. She lost a hundred thousand dollars and good luck. Yeah. And and the guy turned out he was from Nigeria. Yeah. Oh yeah, well, you know. So you know. So the, that's out there, but you can learn really interesting. Don't, you don't ways need to, to give people out. your email address. You don't need to talk to them on the phone. No. You need to meet, meet them up in with them in a safe place. Yes. In a coffee shop for fifteen minutes. If they can't show up. Yeah, then there are, unfortunately, uh, especially with the male population, a group of men who absolutely just love to have text messages and phone calls and all that. But but they don't really want an intimate personal relationship. They want a relationship that they're used to. And there to. are some women. I know some women who like to talk on the phone. Yes. Okay. Exactly. One woman exactly. in particular, she talks but if you on the really phone. really want a or, you know, a lie. To me, that's a waste of time. I like, you know. Well, we want a connection. And I, I think most people do better if they have a real personal connection. Well, if that's what you want. That's I mean, you maybe want. it's okay for people online who just want to talk on the if, phone. If that, if that and makes you happy. And maybe that works for yeah. them. Good. If you want to find one like we did. Yes. It's then different. you don't it's want different. to waste a lot of, of time in yeah. my world because it does. You do have to create a space of time and energy. Mm -hmm. And some people even suggest that you create a little space in your closet <laughs> or in a drawer yes. just to remind yourself that yes. you are creating space for a new idea in your life. And let me say one thing I love about signing up for um, an, a dating app is this. When you put that money in, it tells your brain, your little amygdala grand in your brain that you're dating. Yeah. And that's you, your when you go attitude. out to the coffee shop, you dress a little better, you get out of the sweats, you look around, maybe you go sit at the bar, you know, at, you know, if, bartenders are great. If, if some <laughs> of them are great that know people in your neighborhood, you know, hairdressers and bartenders, yeah. we consider yeah, if they know, therapists. If, <laughs> if your friends know you're online dating, I mean, it may not be online that you'll find the person, yeah. but online may be but the message to the world. Your attitude, it makes you that, open to the possibility. I'm open. And remember, everybody, I want to say this you're only looking for one person. Yeah. Right. Hopefully, person. you're only looking for one person. <laughs> <laughs> In your book, you talk about the uh, 11 common fears. Could we just kind of quickly go over them so that folks can maybe start addressing that? Yeah, uh, sure. I think some of the biggest fears uh, was uh, my niece was saying, we were talking to her, we gave her a book and she said, I'm not good looking. Yeah, I, I, I'm not attractive enough. I see these people online and, uh, you know, I, I, I will never find anyone. And basically, 
That's not true. Well, and, and I don't look good enough. And we like to say, hey, put in a realistic picture of yourself today. It, it, you don't want somebody that can't picture. that isn't in love with what you look like. I mean, there are people who love women that are overweight or men that are overweight. They're actually, you know, yeah. are. I mean, yeah. I don't know what a person is looking for, what draws them. I mean, and you don't know either. You want somebody who sees you for but who you, you are. But if you present a picture of yourself that's not really you, then the people who are attracted to that are not going to be interested in you. You know, you've got to put yourself and who you are, your realistic self out there. And you want that person that sees that picture, sees that profile and says, wow, yeah, this, I didn't think there was anyone out there for me. And this person looks like that. And that's the person that will be your real reward. And I think people, some people are afraid of what friends and family will think. They're oh, silly. Yeah. Yes. It's particularly well, older people yes. that were, were silly and dumb. And guess what mom or dad are doing now? Yeah. You know. And, and your children might initially be positive toward uh, mm -hmm. the, they the might think it's fun and funny, but there's hardly anything in there for them, uh, to, for your for their parents to suddenly find someone, you know, so they're not necessarily going to be the most supportive people and for good reasons, you know, so you yeah, can't yeah. expect them. They've got loyalty to the their yeah. their dad yeah. who may still be living yes. in divorce. And I, I certainly had a role well. in um, having to develop a relationship with your daughters mm -hmm. and and feel that I was not a threat to them in any way and and that um possibly i could be a benefit because i could help their mother feel better and live longer mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so what are some fears you see for guys I uh, well I, many of the guys because you know as you get older for men because of prostate problems or other sorts of things uh, you know the ability to have an erection is not necessarily something uh, that is going to be a part of your later life. And if it's not, many men are afraid, okay, well, I'm useless anymore. No one's going to want me and I'm not going to be able to have a relationship. So I'll either have to have pornography or, or a prostitution rather than be able to have a real relationship. And I can say to men, that's not true. It's a fear but it's not true. You can have an active, loving sexual relationship without having to have an erection. Mm -hmm. And and I think women uh, fear of intimacy and you know having intimacy again can be tough. And you know you need to look at what your desires are, how you deal with them, that kind of thing, and, and have con it's not easy to have conversations. That's why we have given the Through the Bedroom Door chapter to several people who have let their partners read that. <laughs> and one of them just got back together with her old fiance who'd had prostate cancer. Yes. And, after and, he read and, it. and uh, Yeah, and she was able to help him know that what she really wanted was a connection, and she wanted warmth and uh, touching and and uh, for them to be connected it didn't have to have the old sexual connection that they had many years ago but the new sexual connection could be just as valuable and i think that they both discovered that and it yep. was uh, it was wonderful to see yep they're together now awesome mm -hmm. that's beautiful how difficult or easy was it for when you met and you knew that you were getting serious and you wanted to like live together or get married, whatever the, the situation is for, for someone, how easy or difficult is it for folks to give up the security of where they're at now and kind of take that leap? Like, do you both sell your homes if that's the case? Or, I mean, like, how does, how do you start addressing that issue? Well, I, I, like I said earlier, I was planning to move into a senior community because I didn't really want the maintenance issues with my house. So it was very easy for me to say to Gloria, well, okay, why don't we live in your place and I will sell mine and uh, uh, I'll be able to do that. Now, the biggest thing I think for most people 
is to meld your life. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we are writing a second book about how to do that. You know, once you find the person that you really are connected to, how do you make it work? All the processes of where you live, how you're going to uh, meld all of your things and what things are you going to let go of and what things are going to be new. Uh, because, you know, Gloria had many, many things that were connected to her 60-year marriage. So it was a process of us building a life together and then letting and, go. And we are things. working on that. Still. And you gave it most of the stuff for your daughters. And, yeah. and they, they're just getting it early. It, it, it's kind of interesting because, yeah, they're settling my estate in some way before I've even died, which is interesting. And it's really interesting to do that while you're still alive. Ha have your things given to your children and see how they want to respond to it, especially things that belong to their dad, you know, and, right. and it's wonderful. And I say, you know what? I am so happy that they're getting those things. And I, it really makes me feel good that I don't have to compete with their dad anymore. You know, I am a separate person. I am now in, in their mother's life at a later stage. And they have the things that belong to their dad. And we have the new things that belong to us. You know, I think there's one thing that when you first start dating again is I think there's a guilt factor or wondering, you know, I've been with this other person. What about the person that died? You know, uh, I think that can be hard. Fortunately, my husband, uh, before he died, he had, as I said, had a staph infection and he had had one before. So he knew it was very serious and said to me, if, if I die, you're going to find somebody else. And I'm like, oh, no, 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 I'm not. And he said, yes, you are. And we had this little back and forth, uh, you know, argument. So in some ways, he gave me permission to be in a relationship it was very sweet, but not everyone has that. And there's that, you, you know, factor permission. of giving yeah. your, how do you give yourself permission to realize it takes a while to realize they're gone. I deserve a life, mm -hmm. you know, and, um, you know, to do the best I can to move you yeah, know, find that I, you know, at this point, um, you know, the average lifespan is 30 years longer than it was in 1900. And uh, so we have 30 more years. The post-war baby boom is a large number of people that are now living longer. So this issue of the fact that there are going to be relationships at some point, because most women, was it 70% of women? will be widowed. Widowed, yeah. And, and by the way, the average age of widowhood is 57 to 59, by the way. Yeah. And I don't think most women realize that. Yeah. Right. So, do you know, do you really want to have 60? You could live 30 more years by yourself. Yeah. You know, and, and sometimes I, I talk to women and counsel with them and say, don't wait. Yeah. You know, don't wait. Do it now. You know, if, if you want that, if you want a relationship, because I hear some of them say, well, I particularly had uh, a lady whose uh, husband had Alzheimer's and is in, an, you know, in a hospital. I mean, he's not coherent not at all, at, at all. And and uh, she had two boys that are teenagers, one older. But uh, I said, don't wait, you know, years because she said i'd i'd like to meet somebody and be in a relationship and so that's a hard one but um she was able to uh, her husband recently passed away and she is in a relationship and she was had read the book and she said thank you so much it changed my life because yeah. I, am in a relationship. I think two women have to realize and men of course that you're not going to find someone like your 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 soulmate that you had you no. know and, and and at first you like compare when you're dating, you compare all the traits and qualities and things that you had with this new person. And that's like not really a healthy thing to do. And yeah. I think that that discovering that helps too, that not, not to compare whether you're divorced or widowed. I mean, right. yeah, this is a different time in your life if you're right. a little bit older and what worked for you in that period of your life when you were younger is not necessarily what's going to work now. Because, like we said, we we would not we would not be together. If we met in our thirties, no. but you know, when we met in our seventies, hey, 
And now it's a different thing. Yeah, it was what we were looking for. So it's yeah. fun. It, 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 we have a fun relationship. That's what I want to say. It can be really fun and, and it rewarding. Needs to be. It needs yeah, to be. and it, and it, it needs, needs to, be, to be. Yeah, absolutely. Let's talk about, in your book, you talk about forming, storming, norming, and performing, which I love that. <laughs> wow. Yes. Uh, that's a Tuckman, Bruce Tuckman's model that he used. It was in industry, but I've used it before and I really like it. Forming is when, you know, you get together our first. It's the excitement phase. when you Phase feed. for us. But oh, you like your ketchup out of the refrigerator? I like my ketchup yeah. out of the refrigerator. <laughs> So if you look at it, it's a, it's a group process. So I have three daughters. So Frank and I are forming this relationship. They know about it. They're kind of, wow, okay. And then storming is when we talk in the book about my daughters confronting me because I said I wanted to marry Frank. Yes. <laughs> Two yeah, this, after yeah. we met. <laughs> because I was a very conservative girl and felt like if you feel like this is an important relationship, you, you should get, get married. married. Yes. And they're like, no, we don't want you to By get the married. way, we have a marriage license. <laughs> we 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 have done a prenup. Uh and and we're Fiancés. Yes, we are. <laughs> yeah. And we may not get married. Who uh, knows? Yeah, we don't know. But it's it's an option. But we find that it's nice to be able to see it as an option, not a necessity. And I think the necessity on Gloria's part put some pressure on her daughters to think that we were making a terrible mistake. And so they reacted. And it was understandable that, that yeah, they reacted. So we have a whole chapter in there about, about the storming. <laughs> storming with my daughters and how they confronted me. And, oh, my God. And Frank was a therapist, so he was able to handle it. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> it, it wasn't easy, wasn't it? Yeah. So, it's it, you know, it's a, it's a challenge. But I think the most important thing, if you're in a storming phase with your family, is you have really got to have a strong bond. Yes. A commitment between the two of you. You've got to stand up together. Yes. You can't, it can't be one of you. But it, it certainly builds trust and connection to have to deal with people who are not necessarily saying that your relationship is the best thing that's ever happened. It strengthens your relationship if you work on well, it together. And, and you need to. You need to go through that together. I had people in my therapy practice, I had one gentleman whose wife passed away and he was in church and he started dating the organist in the church and uh, they got married and and his kids just came out and and it was so bad that the woman was crying in my office saying well i don't want to stand between him and his children we'll, we'll get a divorce and i'll leave and thank god they didn't and they stood up to the children but they needed help to do that. So uh, there will be times perhaps that you need friends or even a therapist, a therapist. to help you stand up to the criticism. It's powerful. It's, I mean, those powerful. those kids have, they may have estate issues, but they also have loyalty yeah. to their parents yeah. Yeah, and it, that it's we forget about. It, it's yeah. very, very deep. And I think sometimes people say, well, it's just money. I don't think it is and always no, just no. money. I think sometimes it's a loyalty, loyalty. to either the divorced parent yeah. or yeah. to the deceased parent yeah. that they, they, I think it's unconscious, the loyalty. Uh, well, I think it's a part of the natural process of feeling loyal to the parent that's passed away and that you don't think that your other parent is making a, a isn't as loyal. Bringing this as person in to the yeah. tribe. Yes. <laughs> who are, who is this? Thank God I'm part of the tribe. Now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're tribing. Well, <laughs> every so often we untried. Yeah. <laughs> every so often we have to stand up. Every, and say, it comes back up. Okay, yes, guys, cut the crap. <laughs> well, but we, but they know, you know, they know that this is that we're a couple. Sure. I mean, we're not going to break yeah. up over there. Yeah. momentary and, and they can have their objections, and it's perfectly okay. We understand it, but it's not going to make our decision. And like I said, with this couple I worked with, uh, they they probably would have gotten divorced uh, because the new wife just said, I, I can't, I can't see him so unhappy with his children's comments. Yeah. And, and uh, I just don't, I just don't think our relationship 
will last if he's that unhappy. So getting back to it, forming, we got together, storming are the problems we have with yeah. the kids. But storming can come back to let people know. We see it yeah. in therapy all the yeah. time. I saw a guy who three years later, after he mar got married, they decided to he wanted to buy a house with her. Well, three years later, the kids are furious sure. because they don't want him to put more money into a house than she is. I mean, this is three years later. So, you know, the it storm can, may come back better. again. Yeah. And and the person who comes into the relationship may take a hit. You, you may yeah. have to stand up again for your partner and say, hey, kids or relatives or whatever. Yeah. You know, that, so that's the storm. It, it sounds like it's from a selfish perspective uh on the family's part like you should just leave them be and let them find joy and happiness you know in, in their senior years but i a lot of it i think does come from money concerns too yeah yes. ab no, absolutely it, it is and i mean you see it in the states in the newspaper oh all the God, time yes. oh my gosh yes. the, yes. so settle those things in advance have prenups right. you know, plan have wills let people know. I mean, yeah. just be transparent. And, you know, it's because people don't plan well and tell people, you know, what's going to happen and right. you know, how they're going to do it. So and then uh, uh, norming, we're norming right now. We're trying to move into a senior community yeah, together. We, we call this the, the, the second year of our relationship, the year of completion. We're completing all the things that were separate and we're coming together and it's an us now. And so the norming period is an us period where you develop the us. We are now Our norms an established together. couple. Uh, we've been together. We've weathered the storm. Uh, and now we're just working out what are going to be the aspects of our new life together. And it's so different from what my life was before meeting Gloria. It is so different from her life. I've lived in, you know, a me. private residence. I'm, yeah. I sold my house this year and we're, you know, we've done a senior community together. My kids have gone through the house and are, yeah. are taking the, the things that yeah. they want. And it, it's yeah. been really interesting. Yeah. And I honestly think they've done a better job. I have three daughters. I think they've done a better job because they know I'll be mad if they buy it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, that process after a parent <laughs> passes away or both parents pass away, where the family comes together and they start deciding, well, who who's right. going to this picture and who's going to take that statue or whatever, uh, that process is really much different if you're alive and you're saying that okay well uh you know you guys have to work this out what do you want what do i want and, and remember you're related and you love one another <laughs> it, it's funny because i have um uh, phil had my husband had a lot of genealogy and about his family and my daughter's like what do you want us to do with all the genealogies i said it's not my family it's yours <laughs> You know, whatever you guys want to do. It. It's pretty fascinating, actually. It is. Yeah, to, <laughs> to see this process happen. But I, you do have to get into non-attachment, by the way. So if, if people yeah, we're have become a, minimalist, we're we're trying to get down to a hundred items to, between us. Yes. <laughs> and we have a we have a, a right of first refusal. Yes. So if there's anything that Frank wants to bring in that I don't like. There were art pieces that she had that she wants to bring into our new house together. And uh, I, I get a chance to refuse those. And I'm a sculptor. So I had all this old sculpture around, you know. And so she got a chance to say, well, that one's OK. This one, no way. <laughs> yeah, that's good, right? That's right. good, yes. Meeting yeah. in the middle. That's how you become an us. You know what? It's It's just stuff. Yeah. Right, you know. exactly. It's just stuff. Yeah, you really have to. But it's important stuff. <laughs> <laughs> it is, but you don't see any, you know, U Haul trucks following a, a hearse either. So <laughs> that's right. That's you can't know, take it with you. Can't take it with you. You know, it, it gets me when I go into somebody's house and they it's just filled with memories. Yeah. I mean, the oh, whole thing. I mean, it's not this is. This is the way it was. This is the way. I mean, what about the way it is now? 
What about it? If you don't make space in your life too, you don't allow your partner to come into your life. So it's you do so have true. to let go of things so that you can get at the new. That's so you true. do have to be willing to let go. And it letting go is a process. And, uh, you know, there is some sadness about letting go of old yeah. things. Yes. But if you replace it with the new things, uh, that allows exactly. you to go forward. Right. It's okay to have a blank wall and it's take right a trip a and buy a picture wall. together yeah. someday or whatever. But sculptures, there's all the places. <laughs> right. so, how many sculptures did you have? Oh, I had, I had 53 different Oh, sculptures. wow. Oh, my God, yes. And we're, we're now down to 10. Wow, so that's good. Hey, I I really take this as a step in my mental health. Let, <laughs> <laughs> I could let go of these things. Uh, and... For her, it was worth it. And that's oh. what, it, you know, because she's the most important thing in my life, the sculptures are not. So I have Beautiful. to keep my priorities straight. Love it. I love that. That's great. And, and you were asking about the book. The reason I was writing a, a book for widows. And when I met Frank, I said, why don't you write it with me? Because you know about men. I don't know about men. I love your Frank's take on men is so great in the book. You know, it's such an oh, add-on. How do you yeah, not? Break I, I do think it's it's important for us that you have both perspectives in the book. Oh yeah, a male That's perspective and a female perspective. And you did it really nice and open to love. You know, you each get a a, a perspective. A little emoji. <laughs> yeah, very cute, very cute. So, how do you not bring? Um, the baggage and the grief into a new relationship. Because like, I know some couples that they tried dating, like a particular friend of mine, she tried dating, she went on several dates and all they did was talk about themselves. Like they barely asked her anything about her life, you know, and her perspective. It was just blah, blah, blah. Let me talk about me. What do you do in those in those cases, too? I hear a lot of women say that, and particularly with uh, bereaved men want to talk about their wives. And uh, the the guy I was with in the first place, was, oh my. <laughs> he didn't talk to me about her, but he talked to my best friend about her all the time. But here's the thing. I'll have to say to women, men tend to get married seven months after their wife dies. Mm -hmm. Now, you if if you know somebody that you want to connect up with you may have to hear a little bit of that because these guys may need to you may need to get them earlier in their grief than you wanted to but you have to decide but men need to hear that they do need to let go and let go of the baggage and part of the baggage is living in the past it's a dead past or the imagined future. You've got to live in the now. You've got to live currently with the person that you're with. And the past is the past. You don't have to give it up, but you don't have to keep living there. And I would say this, if there's somebody that is only keeps talking about their wife and you really feel like you have a connection, I think you need to be honest. You have to let her know. And you have to say, you know, you may want to write it out, through the next day and talk to, and practice it with your therapist or your girlfriend or something, but be honest with people and say, you know, yeah. maybe it's too early for you. Maybe you can't do this. How do you feel about and, me? Maybe and many men can. do need to hear it from the person of interest that, you know, they need to be more present and more available. And you're not available if you're living in the past. I have to ask you, Frank, how was it for you having me talk about Phil early on? I'm sure you heard more of it than you wanted to. Uh, well, living with living with Phil, I mean, Phil was a huge, huge genius and, a, a, you know, a, a big element and I'll tell you, it was it was daunting at times. You know, there were times when, uh, you know, OK, um, I acknowledge all of the wonderful and beautiful things about Phil, but it's us now. Right. But you put up with it. Well, it's just part of the process of transition. And I. I understood that. And, and I do think it's really important for men, especially if there has been 
a lot of connection and a long-term marriage that you do need to understand that that person is, is important but you need to just go through the period and it will change. It and you do change get, dramatically. And you get over it. And you get over it. You know, you've told your stories, you've done it. You're, yeah, but, it's, but it is something that you have to be mature enough to know that you're not in competition with the person that was in the past. Right. And that uh, you don't want the competition because there's no way of winning uh, in, that competition. So you are just happy about the number of years that you have with your new love. And that's what you want to concentrate yeah. on. And that's that's what's important. And pictures are something. I mean, you know, <laughs> I recently had a guy tell me that his wife died of cancer. And uh, he had pictures of her all over his house. And the hospice worker came in and said, <laughs> time. and said, Time. You got all these wife's pictures around. She said, get rid of him. You're never going to get laid. I love that. I love that. Clearly, you guys have an amazing uh, communication between the both of you. I mean, that's apparent within the first 10 minutes. Um, what do you do when you've met someone and you really have feelings for them, but there's this communication barrier between maybe one person's not as open as the other. Maybe one person talks a lot and the other doesn't, but yet you feel this connection. How do you deal with that challenge? I, I will have to tell you, I, I'm very involved with the Enneagram personality typing system. And I know some people like the Myers-Briggs and Frank likes the introvert extrovert. Hmm. Uh, what's her name that does that? Susan Kane. Susan Kane. So a lot of people, you know, have colors, whatever. If, if there's some way that you can, and some people do astrology, I think we all know on some level, figure out people are different. And, and certainly as therapists, we would say that if that becomes an issue and you really think that it's you're at a impasse and you're not able to do it sometimes a short therapy uh, stay and going and talking about that with a therapist can be extremely helpful to get past that particular issue if that's the one that's holding you back from making progress um you know there's a role in th of therapy we we think that people can do it both with therapy and without therapy. But if you run into an impasse like you're talking mm -hmm. about, I don't think there's anything wrong with going and having some couple counseling and, and getting some help with Absolutely. that. Absolutely. You know, Frank, uh, I've talked about this. Frank's an introvert yes. and I'm an extrovert. And I know uh, some of my behaviors annoy him. And what just keeping up with her, the social calendar, oh, uh, you know, and I've had to learn to say, you know what? I absolutely love another cocktail party, but it's the fourth this week. I think that we probably, uh, you know, I, I, I need to opt out. And she has, she has the option of being able to still go. And I have the option to stay home and read a good book. I yeah. mean, I, so you got to allow there for differences and uh, you, you've got to speak up for yourself. You've got to be assertive. And that's one of the things we talk about in the book is, it's important to be assertive and you can't just give yeses. Yes doesn't mean anything if you can't say no. And when you say assertive, though, it's not assertive saying you can't do that. No, no. It's assertive it's saying it's I. A, it doesn't work for me. I am burned out. I need to stay home today yeah. and I'm going to a play tonight and Frank's not going. Yes. Actually, <laughs> I want to see a play. <laughs> and I have a good book. And Frank's going to stay <laughs> There you go. Too. Flexibility, right? It's all about yes. flexibility. But, you know, would I have done that earlier with my uh, past relationship? No. We were, I think uh, when you have a long-term relationship, particularly when you've got kids, you're uh, operating on a different joint level. At the hip. You have so many. Yeah. Yeah, you don't have to be joined. And the we hip. call us parallel partners in life now. Right. We've, had, we've had lives. We've yeah. both had lives. And how we bring those lives together, you know, is yes. not in, you know, I, I don't know. I don't want to say the marriage thing, but for richer, for poorer, for <laughs> all that. I, you yeah. know, I think we are parallel partners now. We don't have to be there for every right. single thing that goes on in life. But I went to my grandchildren's graduation from college recently and Frank didn't go. 
which was fine. You know, if he want, you know, he's I mean, he's always yeah, open I, to go I, wherever I, he wanted it, to. He it, didn't it, want to. Exactly. And if I and you see, he's doing something that I'm not interested in. If I'm okay. working on a sculpture, she doesn't necessarily have to come in and join me and help me give me tools. <laughs> <laughs> I love in your book that you say the five basic rules of dating are: don't give up, keep making space in your life, go where the action is, growth through setbacks, and then of course have fun. That was absolutely. Really That's it. That's it. And realize there's a lot of growth in dating and taking a risk and being scared. You know, how great is it to feel something? And it, it's yeah. nice having a relationship when you're older because you feel like a teenager in some yeah. way. You know. Yeah, you do get a lot of resurgence of those kind of emotions. You, you, get, you get the energy. I don't yeah. care how old you are, you get silly. <laughs> oh, yeah. Laughter is, is the key to everything. Let me tell you, if you can't laugh and act silly... You're I don't trouble. think you can have a good relationship. Absolutely. So in closing, what advice do you have, not only for seniors, but for just everyone out there struggling to find, you know, their partner, their soulmate, or even just to go have fun and, and date? Like just in summary, what's you, I, I mean, everybody needs to read this book because it's it's such an easy read to and it flows really nicely, like from one topic into the next of relevance. So what um, what advice can you give in summary for folks looking to find that other person? I guess in summary would be for those people who are lonely, you don't have to be lonely anymore. Don't be afraid. Step out and do it now. And, and even if you don't meet Mr. Right or Miss Right, uh, you know, the thing is you can make friends and, and develop connections with people and, and share your experience online and, and your search, your the process. So not everyone you're going to meet is going to be the right person for you, but every person you meet is another possibility for you to share and get involved in life. And it's really getting involved in life. That passion and purpose. You've got to get out. Find there. passion get and purpose. There. Yeah. Don't give up. Really like that. Find passion and purpose. That's brilliant. Well, thanks so much to the both of you. I definitely want to catch up with you for your next book. Right. Uh, that sounds like an awesome topic, like how to transition into your your new life. So we will definitely be in touch again. Thank uh, you both so much. Okay. Thank you for having us on. Of course. Thank you. And if, if there are any questions, folks can leave them in the comments. And I'm sure you can pop back in on occasion and address some of them. Um, that would be awesome. And I will have the book to your uh, the link to your book in the description of this video, as well as running across the screen on your website, which is the golden dating dating doctors doctors com, right? So I will have all that information in the description of this video, as well as running across the screen. Thank you both so very much. This was great fun. Thank you. Thank it was you. great having us on. It was fun. Take care.